Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the latest episode of our Gleebel webinar series. My name is Daniel Quigley. I'm the Director of Business Development and Marketing here at BSI. I hope you, your families, and colleagues are all staying safe and healthy. Our team really misses the days when we could all go out and meet with researchers and learn about challenges that you are facing and help you provide solutions. But since we can't travel, we appreciate you joining us for these webinars as they give us a chance to stay connected. Today's discussion will focus on hot rolling and TMCP studies with an obvious focus on global capabilities. Understanding parameters such as rolled forces, active softening mechanisms, and microstructure evolution is necessary to optimize industrial hot rolling. This webinar hosted by Dr. Fulvio Siciliano is in some ways an extension of his previous webinar from May 21st on recrystallization studies. Today's session will start with a brief review of metallurgical processes that take place during hot rolling and then outline how the Gleeble platform can be used to simulate and optimize these processes. As always, our goal will be to keep this webinar to one hour or less. If time allows, we will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you have questions, please submit them using the chat feature here in the webinar. As usual, usual we have a team of DSI Gleeblers here to answer questions directly in the chat during the presentation, or we may be able to address some of the questions during the Q&A portion of the meeting if time allows. We have over 350 people registered to attend today, so we may not be able to address every question. However, we will do our best, and we will follow up after the webinar if needed. Video of this presentation will be available online soon. We should have it up within about an hour or two after the webinar ends. You'll be able to find the link to this video as well as videos of past webinars by going to our website, Gleeble.com, and then click on the resources link in the top navigation bar. And then in the drop down menu, click on webinars, and there you'll be able to find uh, view recorded webinars as well as sign up for future webinars. And I encourage you to do that. Next Thursday's webinar will focus on strip annealing capabilities. Now I'd like to introduce my good friend Fulvio Siciliano to present. Fulvio has been helping DSI provide technical support to clients around the world. He's a well-known specialist in hot rolling of steels, mathematical modeling of hot deformation, recrystallization studies, and qualification of steel for oil and gas transmission pipeline. Fulvio has written textbooks and published about 100 technical papers that explore these research areas. Fulvio, thank you for preparing this presentation, and I'll hand this over to you. Hey, thank you, Dan, uh, for this uh, nice introduction. C can you hear me, by the way? I can. Okay, clear. good. So, uh, well, thank you everyone for uh, attending uh, this uh, TMCP and hot rolling webinar. Uh, I present a very basic uh, well, information and, and, and a very basic review of hot rolling and TMCP. And I'll give a few examples uh, wh where a global platform can be useful uh, to study hot rolling and hot deformation. Uh, so I will be happy to continue the communication and go deeper uh, in the specific subjects uh, during this one hour and also uh, after the webinar, as Dan said. So uh, this is a, an outline for today's uh, webinar. Uh, we have an introduction that we will review uh, well, a few points on hot deformation and hot rolling. We focus on steels. Uh, then. Uh, I will show how Glebo platform can be used uh, for the studies and then show a few industrial examples and summarize at the end. So uh, this is where we stop in the last uh, recrystallization webinar. Uh, we see here that well, we have, this is just a schematic drawing of a continuous casting uh, and then we have the casting and the slabs cut and uh, we have something here is the, the hot rolling uh, that well, it's a schematic re representation by a pasta machine, and after that we go to the uh, well to the runout table and continue screening. So let's focus on the central part uh, today, uh, and well, just just for starting, I'd like to see that this uh, well the uh, hot working is known for for a long time, maybe more than a thousand or a few. 2000 years, but there was a first, let's say, written evidence of uh, recrystallization and green growth and, and, hot, and recrystallization and hot working uh, in the first metallurgy, metallurgy book, uh, De La Pirotecnia, 
So this was, uh, was well known empirically that if you heat a piece of metal, you can deform that easily because well, they didn't have information about grain size, about uh, crystal structures, uh, but they, ha they have a lot of uh, empirical information that old blacksmiths, uh, they knew all that and they know how to work with a metal. So this knowledge was available uh, for, for sure for more than 500 years ago. And this is just to summarize, uh, well, four cases uh, of, of hot rolling and hot extrusion. Hot rolling is a, let's say, median uh, deformation or median level deformation, and hot extrusion is a high level deformation. So first thing, uh, I forgot to apologize. There is a construction site here uh, on the side of my office. And uh, so just to let you guys know that I'm not in a steel plant right now. That is very noisy as well. So uh, the first two cases, uh, we have the, the hot rolling and the upper case is the high stacking fault energy metal. So high stacking fault means that recovery uh, happens very fast. So in this way, uh, once you have the deformation, this is the deformation zone, we have a lot of dynamic recovery. Dynamic means that occurs inside the deformation zone and so since recovery is so fast, we do not have enough driving force for recrystallization. So we continue uh, with static recovery. If we have a low stacking fault energy metal, let's say like austenite, uh, so in the deformation zone, you have again dynamic recovery, but it's not enough to decrease the number of dislocations and the driving force. In this way, uh, there will be a nucleation and growth of recrystallized grains statically because it's outside the deformation zone. So uh, if you look at the uh, extrusion case, if you have, a, a, well, there's a 99% reduction. So this is a very high uh, deformation or very high strength levels. So uh, the billet is extruded here and you form this bar. And uh, well, uh, for a high stacking fault energy method, uh, metal, uh, we have the dynamic recovery, but this is not enough to remove all the defects. And so a static recrystallization happens because there is a driving force. So we still have dislocations in the microstructure that is the driving force for uh, recrystallization. And uh, if you go to a, a low stacking fault energy metal, let's say like, uh, well, austenite again, uh, we have the, well, the, the generation of this location is so high that recrystallization occurs uh, inside the deformation zone. So this is dynamic recrystallization just because it's inside a deformation zone and uh, it progresses as a static recrystallization. I'm not sure if the term metadynamic was used at that time. This was from McQueen and Jonas in 1975. Uh, I'll show what is uh, the metadynamic crystallization in a minute. Just want to show a couple of examples of these two processes, uh, hot rolling and hot extrusion. I'm using pasta as an example, uh, having fun with the old pasta machines I found from my grandmother. Uh, as you can see, my pasta is green uh, because I add some alloying elements to that and the alloying elements are uh, spinach in this case. So let's keep moving. Uh, metadynamic recrystallization. Uh, well, again, the same uh, the same way. The metadynamic is important because well, it it's it is initiated or nucleated inside the deformation zone and it grows after unloading or outside the deformation zone until completion. Uh, why it's so important in rolling? Because in rolling, well, the deformations used in rolling, you, you very uh, well you never can reach. Uh, a full cycle of dynamic recrystallization. So this is most of the time when it happens, it's just enough to nucleate the dynamic grains and they you grow statically or metadynamic or post-dynamic. And the, this is the, the, the kinetics curve. It's a Komogorov of, uh, of Rami Johnson Mel curve. Uh, so this is a typical nucleation growth uh, mechanism. So this is the metadynamic uh, or post-dynamic. This is the most common in uh, in uh, steels when it happens. Uh, for uh, well, I think 
I think all of us, we've never seen uh, any dynamic crystallization in any metal, but uh, I found this video, actually this video was given to me by uh, Professor John Jonas when I was doing my PhD at McGill uh, University. And uh, he gave me this video showing actual uh, uh, dynamic crystallization. But instead of a metal, it was an ice. So let's see what happens. So this is ice under compression. We see that it's, uh, uh, well, we see here that some grains nucleation. Uh, this is, uh, uh, nucleation happens in the, in the grain boundaries. We can see here, if you look this, this way, yeah. And then we can see that there's more or less like a necklace mechanism. That is the nucleation uh, mechanism that is usually associated with dynamic crystallization. Uh, well, ice is optically active under uh, polarized light, and this is polarized light. That's why we see all these colors. And uh, the interesting point is that uh, every, well, every grain orientation, we have a different color. For example, here we have this red coming and this is because, well, the deformation is changing the grain uh, orientation or texture. Here you have a blue here, so this shows that we have a different colors uh, with different uh, grain orientations. And this, this are changing all the time. As you can see, it lasts for days. So we have, uh, well, this, uh, well, just this, this, uh, this video, uh, it's well accelerated. The total length of the video was four days, and we have more actually continued, just, just a piece of that, so that you can see that dynamic crystallization happens. And uh, actually, the geologists, they study dynamic crystallization because it happens actually in rocks, in geology, rocks that are under pressure and high temperatures and well down inside the earth. So dynamic crystallization is a process also. It's not uh, exclusive of metals. So the rocks, and minerals, they also can undergo to dynamic crystallization. So at least you can see that you saw dynamic crystallization one day. Well, just coming back to hot rolling now, uh, we have, uh, I, I try to cover and analyze the three basic rolling strategies here. Uh, the first one uh, uh, on, on the upper side is the uh, crystallization controlled rolling where we are rolling above the temperature of non crystallization So uh, basically we submit the metal uh, to several cycles of work hardening and crystallization. Work hardening, we have the grains pancaked here and after uh, in the interpass time, they recrystallize and form in the axial grains again. So when you use that, uh, when you have a very heavy gauge and you want to reduce, apply heavy reductions and you, you're close to the upper limit of, of the mill. So we cannot go to, uh, your forces cannot increase. So this is a way to keep the forces low. So this is the recrystallization controlled rolling. And then we have the conventional controlled rolling, also uh, uh, commonly uh, uh, mentioned as TMCP, thermal mechanical processing uh, process control where we roll below the temperature of non crystallization so we cause uh, uh, increasingly pancaking or work hardening of the grains. The grains are just being elongated. And at the end, we generate a very high surface area of grain boundaries. And this will, uh, will uh, uh, have a very high uh, nucleation rate of the new grains after the cooling. So this is a way to refine the grain size, and this is heavily used for line pipe steels, for example. Another way that we can generate fine grains is to do the dynamic crystallization control rolling, and this is a way to, we can trigger dynamic crystallization in one or more passes in the rolling schedule. Uh, we know that dynamic crystallization cause a very intense grain refinement, so we, we have a very fine uh, austenite grains just before cooling, and this will also result in very fine uh, ferrite uh, or bainite or whatever phase you have at low temperatures for that chemical composition. So this is the basic, the three basic rolling strategies that we see today. Uh, and that, then the rolling stage. So the first thing we do, we have to, if we have a slab, uh, we need to reheat the slab. And the aim of reheating that happens between, usually between uh, 1100 and 1250, depending on the process, if it's a uh, hot strip rolling or plate rolling. Uh, so the aim is to decrease hot deformation resistance so we can apply 
uh, strains at the low and low uh, at lower forces. Also, we put the alloying elements into solution, and of course, it causes some side effect. It causes some oxidation. Uh, then the next stage is rough rolling, and well, it's usually performed between 1200 and 950 degrees, depending on the process. So the idea here is to apply high strain to reduce the thicknesses and uh, low strain rates, uh, 5 to 30, this is a typical uh, strain rates uh, in rough rolling. So the aim is to reduce the thickness and to apply heavy reductions. Also to have a microstructure refinement and also closing the defects of continuous casting. You can have voids, you can have some uh, segregation uh, inside this lab and also you have the S-cast microstructure formed of dendrites. So you can get rid of that by homogenizing the microstructure and creating uh, a structure of grains. Uh, after that, we have the finishing rolling that you, well, it's performed at the lower temperature. Remember that the temperature decreases constantly and we have the strings, uh, bet uh, well, lower strings as compared to rough rolling. The aim here is to reduce to final thickness and to be very precise. You need to, to go in, well, in the range and cause further refinement that well, we, can, we can have some microalloys precipitation and austenite pancaking to, uh, to perform the uh, conventional control rolling. And uh, so this is uh, the aim is to reduce to final thickness and produce uh, austenite uh, pancaking in some cases. Uh, finally, we uh, well the steel goes to the well to the runout table in a hot strip mill or to accelerated cooling in a plate mill, and we have a phase transformation. And the amount and the volume fractions of phases will be very important to obtain the final uh, properties. So this is a graphic representation of the TMCP. Again, we also, uh, this is temperature and time. We austenitize on the reheating and have the first roughing stage where we have the formation of grains. Then you have some uh, waiting time for the temperature to decrease. And then we have the second uh, rolling stage that is the finishing. And you have the austenite pancaking and the transformation if you apply uh, slow transformation, uh, uh, slow cooling rates, you go to ferrite per plus perlite. Fast cooling rates, you can go ferrite plus bainite or uh, acyclor ferrite. This is the thickness range. Uh, this is a typical from a plate mill. Let's say start from a slab of 250 millimeter thick, and then the transfer bar will be uh, about 80 millimeters, and let's say the plate, final plate, will be 20 millimeters. So this is a typical. I'll show some practical cases at, at the end. Uh, okay, the steels, the penny. This is a CCT diagram, a continuous cooling transformation diagram. And depending on the cooling rate, if it's a slow cooling rate, you have ferrite plus perlite. If it's a high cooling rate, you can have mostly bainite in the microstructure. Usually this is a typical uh, cooling rate for line pipe steels. Uh, they lie in this range here. Uh, then you have ferrite plus uh, bainite. I'm talking about, of course, at, uh, uh, X65 and up uh, uh, in strength. Uh, this is uh, three examples of Ferrite plus perlite microstructure, microstructure resulting of a, of a slow cooling, and then ferrite plus acicular ferrite and the acicular ferrite of very fast cooling. So just some examples of microstructures. Uh, we have here again this uh, well stress strain curve where we can identify the uh, the softening mechanism, or if there is a softening mechanism. So we have here the stress strain and the work hardening curve is this one that goes continuously up. Uh, if you have some, some uh, mechanism of softening, for example, dynamic recovery uh, during the deformation, that's why it's dynamic. So it goes to a flat plateau. Once we have an equilibrium of uh, dislocations generated due to the application of the strain and the dislocation annihilated by recovery or by dynamic recovery. So uh, we have this plateau. If we see a peak and a decay in the stress, this means that you have a massive amount of 
softening. And this is uh, only possible with grain boundary migration and then grain boundary migration is recrystallization. So we have this dynamic recrystallization uh, that is, is shown here when we have a peak. We also have the dynamic transformation of ferrite. We know that ferrite is formed uh, in austenite and it's strain induced. So when apply strain, we also uh, we, uh, we can have the formation of ferrite most of the time. Uh, the critical strain for the dynamic transformation of ferrite is, let's say it's about uh, lower than the critical strain for dynamic recrystallization. So it happens actually earlier than dynamic recrystallization. And there, well, in the last 15 years or maybe uh, 20 years, uh, several studies have, have been published that and we have actually uh, X-ray evidence of the formation of ferrite at austenite uh, temperatures above AE3. So this is this is a way that looking by looking at the stress strain curve, we 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 know what's going on, uh, what which mechanism is operating. So let's let's see how we can use the Glebo for the studies, both of the uh, rolling and um, uh, and also to identify the mechanism. Of course, we can perform such a curve in, in, in a Glebo machine, just a stress train, a very basic experiment for a Glebo. And uh, we have, uh, well, the stress train curve and then we, can, we know what's going on. But let's see the most popular methods that are used for uh, simulating rolling, uh, hot rolling. So the first one is torsion. Uh, I'm a big fan of torsion. I use torsion a lot especially during my module years. Uh, so this is how the torsion specimen looks like. Uh, it's a, well, uh, the actual torsion will be applied in the central area here where we have the reduced uh, diameter. Uh, so this is, well, with this specimen geometry, we can, we can reach strain rates of about 20 per second. And by, by increasing the diameter and reducing the central area, we can, get close to 100 per second. Of course, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a two to one ratio between uh, the, uh, the length of the central area and the diameter. Uh, so, well, you may need, you may want to respect that or not. Uh, it's up to you. So uh, the torsion, uh, actually the stress strain curve is calculated by the, uh, the torque and the strain is calculated by the, uh, using the angle. So we, we transform torque and angle, that is the output of a torsion test in a stress strain. And important to remind that torsion is a simple shear uh, deformation. So uh, the other method is the plane strain compression that we, uh, we do that in the, in the hydro wedge MCU. That is basically a specimen that is flat and is compressed by these two anvils. You see the anvils, they have an angle here. And uh, so the stress strain is calculated, basically this is a, stress is like a pressure, so it's calculated by a force over the area. So the area below the anvil that is, touches the specimen and the strain is calculated uh, using the initial and final thicknesses. So the strain rates that you can reach at this, uh, uh, well, with this test is 100 per second. And with the Glebo Hydro Wedge, we can apply uh, several subsequent passes at very high uh, strain rates and uh, very uh, short interpass times between the passes. So, it, so it, 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 it's like a machine gun that uh, you see that very fast passes can be applied. And uh, again, it's a pure shear deformation is another example of shear deformation. And I'm really sorry for my drawing, so it's not in the right angle. But if you approximated uh, this curve here, well, let's let's draw it. Maybe it's a, it's going to be better. Yeah, if you approximate that for a round uh, or almost round uh, here, well, it could be let's say a, a, a work row, or in, in a rolling mill could be like the, a work row in a rolling mill that is touching the specimen. So I just want to show that. The plane strain compression is selected by some researchers because geometrically it looks like a uh, rolling mill. So we have, as in, in the rolling, you have the, the length being increased 
and the thickness being decreased by the application of the strain, just like it was geometrically very similar to rolling. But, and if you look at the, uh, well, the torsion, well, they're geometrically, of course, is not similar to rolling. But uh, I just compared, uh, yeah, this is, uh, if you said, well, why don't you compare side by side plane strain and torsion? I'm sorry, well, in the presentation, the curves became the same color, but this one that it shows higher stresses for high strains, this is the plane strain. And so it, for high stress, uh, strains, it usually shows higher stresses than torsion. Torsion is this lower curves here. So uh, in, initially I thought it was because of friction thing, but uh, actually I talked to uh, Professor Sergei Aksanov from Russia uh, one day and he said, oh, look, I have a paper, I made some modeling of the effect of strain uh, under the wall in the specimen and the plane strain a compression specimen, and we actually see that there is a very high gradient of strains in uh, well in uh, inside the, the plain strain compression specimen. This is actually the reason why we have this uh, well this higher uh, strain uh, stresses for very high strains because we have a gradient. <clears throat> excuse me, and it's much more. Uh, if you compare to torsion, it's a much, much more smooth uh, process as compared to plane strain. But geometrically, it looks like uh, rolling. And just putting that side by side in this table, uh, if we have torsion, rolling, and plane strain, uh, if we have the same conditions, thermomechanical conditions, they are all plane strain deformation. So the, uh, the strain increments occur in two directions, so this is plane strain. They are all shear deformation, so torsion being simple shear and rolling and plane strain being pure shear or flattening. Uh, but the texture in the slip systems activated are, uh, of course, different if you consider torsion and the other two. So rolling and plane strain, they, they usually they activate the same slip systems and they produce the same uh, deformation textures. So. Uh, the difference, as you can see, is of secondary but not primary importance. And uh, the, the big advantage of torsion is that you can apply uh, uh, very high uh, strains and you can actually simulate from roughing to finishing in the same specimen. So this is one of the basic advantages. You can absorb a lot of strain uh, by using torsion tests. Uh, well, let's just start now just with some... Uh, uh, experiments want well, we to be close to the industrial side. How we can uh, make an annealing or reheating experiment? So it's a very simple experiment. You just have to increase the temperature and have the uh, well the uh, reheating time. Of course, this is a, after soaking. You have a flat uh, uh, a flat uh, plateau here, and then you uh, cool down very quickly, so you can freeze the microstructure of the reheated specimen. So when you're reheating a slab, of course, the slab is a massive piece of metal, and you have different heating rates in the center and in the surface, also the plateaus, but we can uh, actually do exactly what happens for that specific point. So you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, simulate the whole uh, reheating process in all areas of the slab, but you can actually uh, 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 perform the simulation for uh, specific points that are discrete points that you select. So you can see in the surface is one uh, one uh, is one heating rate uh, and one thermal cycle. In the center is another thermal cycle. So you can you can uh, simulate both. And at the end, what do you want to know? You want to know the grain size. You want to know if the halogen elements went to solution, so that you play their role during uh, hot rolling. And uh, so this is the basic. Uh, and of course, you want to see if you get rid of the precipitates that are eventually there, and you want to dissolve those precipitates. So that's all you want to check. So you can get in specimen and, and check for all that. Uh, if you were looking just for the grain size, so you can also, well, I showed this example last, uh, last webinar. You can use the LUMAT, that is a laser ultrasonics uh, measurement. Uh, to measure the grain sizes, and 
Of course, you can have this real time uh, grain size measurements. Well, this is hundreds of measurements in a few minutes. Uh, as well, if you do that, let's say by metallography, you can spend weeks or months polishing specimens and looking at the microscope and doing the quantitative metallography, counting the grain size and so on. Uh, so we can you can use LUMAT to perform that if you're looking just for grain size. Of course, LUMAT cannot detect uh, the solution of a precipitate that is a very low volume fractions in the steel, uh, but it can detect uh, it, it can detect the grain sizes. So uh, another very important point, extremely important point, is to have a good row force prediction uh, in in the well, in, in the plant. So uh, the row force, of course, the force is applied in the rows, and uh, we have here a very, uh, let's say, non-uniform deformation zone. We have numeric, uh, numerical methods today to, uh, well, to have the, the deformation and the stresses and the strains at, well, at specific points here in the row gap, uh, but uh, one way that we can connect this complex uh, the formation zone with a very simple, uh, geometrically simple uh, mechanical test like torsion or like plane strain compression is the an analysis of the mean flow stress. So uh, we can we can define the mean flow stress in a stress strain curve made in a laboratory by well the mean flow stress or the average stress between two deformation uh, two deformations or two strains can be calculated by this formula. And basically, this is the area below the curve divided by the strain increment. And this is the mean flow stress or the average uh, flow stress in a flow stress curve that you can obtain in the lab. And in the mill, uh, if we use SIMS formulation that uh, were derived in 1954, so SIMS also defined an average flow stress in the row gap. And well, it, it, well, this is the equation, the, the Sims equation. This is the row force, and this is a geometric factor, the, well, the mysterious geometric factor. And uh, we have the width and the row radius and the initial and final thickness. So you can calculate the mean flow stress in the mill and the mean flow stress in the lab. So that, there is a connection for a simulation. We analyze the mean flow stress and we know um, what's going on in the mill by analyzing the mean flow stress. How we do that, <clears throat> excuse me again, uh, we have this mean flow stress curve and we plot the mean flow stress against the inverse of the temperature. And so this is a five pass schedule, uh, just for an example. And we see that, well, between pass number one and number two, we have this slope, this is a small slope, and uh, this is, uh, well, we associate that to full softening between paths. So the, 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 actually the slope is just because the decrease in temperature. As we decrease the temperature, we have uh, higher uh, hot deformation resistance. So uh, this is just due to decreasing the temperature. If you check a change in slope here, so uh, we, we associate that with a strain accumulation. So strain accumulation, uh, or, or incomplete softening is happening between pass number two and pass number three. So in this way, we know we can detect that by analyzing the mean flow stress curve. If you see a peak or a load or a mean flow stress drop, uh, you can associate that with dynamic plus metadynamic crystallization uh, because we have a very massive and very fast uh, uh, softening. And we can see that in the mean flow stress curve in a, as a roll drop, especially this drop uh, occurs in the last passes. If, if, we, if there is dynamic crystallization here, usually you don't see a low drop because, well, usually this is a full softening region. And after the dynamic crystallization, it can have again the strain accumulation and it can have this slope. Just to remind that dynamic transformation of ferrite, strain induced dynamic transformation of ferrite in the austenite temperatures of hot rolling happens, uh, well, this happens all the time. Okay, during uh, roughing, uh, during finishing, uh, and also uh, during, uh, well, uh, the, the high temperature and low temperature, uh, whenever you are in the, in the austenite or above AE3 uh, 
uh, every time you have the formation of dynamic ferrite. So this is very important, very important because well, ferrite is softer than austenite, and this might be reflected in the uh, in the row force. So just have three examples here: the hot strip mill and how uh, we we do the simulation. So this is a hot strip mill rolling schedule, and you see this is the roughing rolling. And uh, we have this full softening between passes, and we have this mean flow stress slope. And in finishing, we have a different slope. This is, means that we this means that we have an incomplete soften. And this separation between the two regions is well. This is the TNR on the temperature of non Uh If you look for a things lab casting machine. So things lab, they start from an 80 millimeters lab, they never cool down, they go to a tunnel furnace and they will go straight to the finishing mill. Uh, well, there is a there is a there is a global system to study that is the uh, HDS V40 that is a, a direct rolling simulator. Basically, what you have inside is a crucible where we can melt the steel sample and the anvils for plane strain compression here up and down. We have two anvils. So what we do in this machine, first thing we melt the sample here in the center and we solidify. So we have the S-cast microstructure, just like the things like. And after that, you apply the plane strain deformation and uh, well, by, by the anvils here. And this is the, the specimen after the deformation. This is after cooling. So with that, you can simulate uh, what's going on in the uh, things like casting a uh, direct rolling process. So let's see how a, a mean flow stress curve looks like. We have only uh, the finishing passes, so it's six passes, and we have here a uh, full softening slope and um, uh, work hardening or strain accumulation slope again, and a separation that is the TNR. So there's a TNR in uh, also in the things like casting. Or, should be should have if you have let's say uh, uh, microalloy elements in the chemical composition and finally plate rolling plate is a well it's a different uh, it's a, it's a, a very different uh, from the others because you have a roughing rolling uh, well having at uh, at very high temperatures and they occur mostly at the same temperature because you have a lot of heat being generated by deformation after that you have a long waiting time to reach the finishing temperature, and then you have the finishing slope or the strain accumulation slope. If you plot all them side by side, uh, we see here, well, the temperatures, well, it's a very elastic temperature range for both uh, hot strip meal and plate meal, and a narrow temperature range for the things like casting a direct rolling meal. So we can, by looking at the stress strain curves, we can have a lot of information for the hot rolling meal. And well, just for fun, one day uh, I plotted industrial data from heavy gauge strip and light gauge strip, uh, normalized uh, for strain rate, and I plotted it together with torsion tests of the same steel chemistry, and we see that uh, they fall in the same well in the same trend. So uh, again, uh, simulations, the global simulations, are very reliable uh, to uh, well to compare that with or to get information for hot rolling. So I just finalized, this is the, the, the uh, final uh, industrial case that I'd like to show. Uh, this is this is a, an example of plate rolling, and I have here, uh, sorry to show all this uh, large amount of numbers, but to show what's going on here. This is the standard rolling schedule, and uh, suppose that the, well, the quality managers say, look, we, we have our grain sizes are not small enough. We need to uh, decrease the grain size, and also they are not uniform enough. So what we see in this standard rolling schedule that is being used in the roll in, in the mill. So it's a seven roughing passes and eleven finishing passes. Uh, strains being several strains being applied along the, 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 the well, along the schedule. Interpass times. Uh, depending on the size of the plate, of course, it increases the length and increases the interpass time. Except by this one, that this is the uh, well, the, uh, uh, well, this is the transition between roughing and finishing, and the temperatures, starting from uh, 11:50 and finishing at 8:10, at several uh, well, different strain rates: six for for roughing and ten for finishing. 
we know that by decreasing the temperature, you also decrease the green size in hot rolling. So uh, you can come with this idea to decrease the temperature. Oh, everything is the same except by the temperature that was decreased by 40 degrees in the whole schedule. So we started here at 11.10 and we finished at 7.70. Of course, if you come to the hot meal manager and say, look, I have, I have this idea, let's decrease the temperature and we might get to low, uh, well, finer grain size. Of course, uh, the hot meal manager, they want to keep, have hot meal managers, they want to keep a safe distance uh, from metallurgists uh, because you have this all these crazy ideas and you want to risk your meal and your prediction uh, by testing your crazy ideas. But you can have even another crazy idea is to, we know that the, the higher the deformation, uh, uh, the higher the applied strain, the smaller the grain size, and then you, you select, you, you make another schedule that uh, you have left passes and high deformation per pass in the whole schedule. So you end up having a, a less passes and, and you keep the same temperature range as in the standard schedule. So I use the reheating temperature uh, 1220 for 180 seconds. So this is a torsion specimen. This is a small specimen, specimen. So this 180 seconds, it's reasonable. And the cooling rate was applied 13 degrees per second for all the, all the three uh, simulations, uh, torsion simulations. So let's see how the mean flow stress curve looks like. So that this blue curve is the reference or the standard schedule. So this is what, what the rolling mill is doing right now. If we reduce the temperature by 40 degrees, so we have some areas that the, the passes will be, or, uh, the mean flow stress will be higher. So the row forces will be higher. And if you increase the reduction per pass, you have, let's say, a consistent uh, increase in the mean flow stress and consequently in the row force. So you can, you can argue, well, we can discuss with the, uh, the, the, the new guys to say, look, at 380 uh, uh, megapascal of mean flow stress, this will be, let's say, uh, for, uh, 40,000 kilonewtons force in our mill. So we are below our upper limit. So we are using 50% of the capacity. So let's try. So you can you can actually convince them by, well, or try to convince them by using the skirts. Another way to convince, if you look at the microstructure, so we have the three microstructure resulting of the, the, the rolling sketches. Uh, simulation. And if you measure the grain sizes here, uh, well, on, on the standard schedule, you have five micron plus or minus eight. By reducing the temperature by 40 degrees, you have, well, it's like grain refinement, 43 degrees, and some better uniformity of the grain size. So the, you see that the standard deviation also dec uh, decreased. So you have finer and uniform. If you look at the schedule C, you have a very, a more intense grain refinement, and also a better uh, uniformity of the grains. So because of the, well, the uh, we can see that by the standard deviation. So you go into the direction that you want to be uh, if you test one of the metallurgist uh, crazy, uh, crazy ideas. You just need to, of course, to have a solid uh, background to propose that and suggest that schedule change, right? And this, this is where, where Libo can be very useful. So I just want to summarize. Uh, so what kind of outputs we can have from, from a Blibo hot rolling simulation? Uh, first, we can have the green size evolution, uh, the final microstructure of the steel. Uh, we, can, we can have well, uh, a very good prediction of the hot deformation resistance and the roll forces and, the, and the, by, the, by checking the mean flow stresses. Uh, you, can, you can calculate the soften between passes between the double heat uh, uh, tests that I just showed uh, in the last uh, webinar. Uh, you can determine the TNR. Uh, you can correlate uh, the processing parameters with the final mechanical properties. Uh, you, can, uh, you can also influence, uh, check the influence of uh, processing variations at zero cost as compared to industrial trial. Uh, so it's uh, almost negligible cost if you run the simulation in the Glebo. Uh, you can become creative at the hot rolling mill. That, of course, this is not welcome for the, uh, let's say, in, for productivity, but you can have a very solid uh, background to, to suggest uh, 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 schedule changes 
aiming for a quality improvement. And you, of course, you can avoid the risky full-scale trials in the rolling mill. So this is basically what I have to present. Uh, well, I think we have a, some time for questions. And well, thank you very much for your participation. So you see some more images of uh, the pasta making, uh, and I'm making, I'm using my microloid pasta. Very good. Thank you, Fulvio. That was very interesting. And uh, I think you're making everybody hungry as well as we're watching this. Uh, I think we did have a question if we can get your grandmother's pasta recipe as well. Uh, he would be interested in that. Uh, so we did have a few questions. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I did also put a, uh, one of our colleagues did uh, provide some recommended reading and I did post that in the, the chat area. Uh, thanks, Sam, for, for sending that along. Uh, we did have a handful of questions uh, and now some are coming in pretty quickly now. But I did want to ask Fulvio, can you, uh, this question came in early in the presentation. I think you did address it to some extent during the presentation, but maybe you can uh, readdress it. Uh, it said, what is the difference in, difference in static and metadynamic recrystallization since both of them occur after deformation? Right. Well, the difference is, is because, well, let me, let me get there. Uh, difference is, uh, can you see, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, the basic difference is because, well, the static recrystallization, it is nucleated and, uh, and grown in, uh, after, in the interpass time, as opposed to the metadynamic recrystallization that is actually nucleated, uh, the nucleation of the grains is inside the deformation zone and, uh, and the growth is outside the deformation zone, so in, uh, during the, the interpass time. So this is the basic difference. Uh, the reason that we, we difference is say, oh, but this is uh, it's just it's just like static crystallization. Yes, but there's a there's this low area in the in the kinetics curve. There's a very low, let's say, kinetics area here, and this is avoided when you have the grains dy uh, dynamically nucleated. So uh, basically, this area here. If you look at the static recrystallization, this is much longer. So, so it takes much, uh, much more time in this initial stages of the recrystallization because the nucleation of dynamic grains is very fast. And also, in, in this way, the kinetics of metadynamic recrystallization is as fast as the uh, uh, as the dynamic recrystallization kinetics, and but it happens outside the deformation zone. So if you compare one and the other. The static recrystallization has a slow kinetics, and the metadynamic recrystallization, even though if it occurs at an, the unloading zone, it has a very fast kinetics. So the the completion of the recrystallization in the interpass time is usually complete. Great, thanks, uh, Fabio. Uh, another question uh, came in, and uh, wanted you to address this. I think some of the questions. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wayne Chen has been responding, which we appreciate. Uh, but this one I wanted to, to throw your way. Uh, it said that you, you showed uh, that SRX and DTF uh, dynamic transformed ferrite at high temperature, uh, for example, in the beginning of rolling. Uh, how does DTF, how can this take place at, at this temperature? Uh, this usually takes place close to AR3. This is right. Uh, I, well, I, I never uh, believe it. Uh, that much on that uh, on that dynamic transformation until I met uh, well uh, Dr. Samuel Rodriguez and Dr. Claude Aranas. They are both professors, and I joined there. Uh, at, I joined them uh, with John Jonas in the well, in this group generated at McGill University. So I was very skeptical about that. How a, a ferrite can be uh, formed in the uh, in the austenite region? And the reason is that, well, we have thermodynamic conditions for that formation. Another reason, let's say a macroscopic region, is that if you have a restriction to deformation, for example, if you have a high deformation resistance and you have a very high external strain being applied, we know that the ferrite is softer than austenite. If you're in the dual phase, uh, you see that uh, well, uh, ferrite is softer than austenite, uh, and it's a way that the material finds to absorb the external deformation. But 
uh, well, it's still uh, some some. Uh, actually, the evidences were mostly by metallography that you see that the dynamically transformed ferrite can be frozen at ambient temperature and they look different. They have a different shape and texture as compared to the normal ferrite for, formed during cooling. But uh, I was not still convinced. So what I did, I took a, a well a few specimens. I went to the synchrotron lab in Brazil that has a Glebo machine. So we use synchrotron light uh, X-ray diffraction and we actually, I actually, I perform uh, such a stress strain curve that I'm showing in the screen. And uh, under X-ray diffraction, I detected ferrite peaks being formed uh, in well every, uh, well in all the steps, and they were actually dissolved after unloading. So they retransform back to wallstonite. So it is there, and it certainly decreases at some extent. At the raw forces. So this is a very well. This is a, a, a very long subject. Uh, we can. Uh, I'm not sure who, who proposed the question, but we can get in touch after after the webinar, and I can well can send you some papers, and also we can have some uh, live discussions. Great, thank you, Fulvio. I think we have time for another question. Uh, well, first uh, there was a question, and there's been some questions in the past. Uh, there will be an e certificate that gets sent out uh, about an hour after this webinar ends, an email will get sent out and it will contain an e-certificate. So uh, look for that in your email. Uh, we did have a question, uh, full view, it's on slides 36 and 37 of your presentation. Uh, it said, what about the study of defect generation? So I'm not sure exactly what that question is referenced to, but maybe you're able to talk a little bit about defect generation uh, looking at these two slides. Well, uh, this is a, this is a generation uh, of, of, of let's say a, a mean for, uh, well of the facts, of course, because we are applying strains here in this in this three uh, rolling schedules, and the defect generation or the dislocation generation. This is a consequence of the strains of the strain application. So I, I, I actually I didn't get the question exactly, but every time we apply strain. We have a mean flow stress. If you don't apply strain, mean flow stress will be zero because there will be no strain. But if you apply strain, there will be a resistance to that strain. And up to a certain extent, and depends on the amount of strain you apply, then you generate more dislocations. And these dislocations will be uh, the driving force for softening. I'm not sure if I get the question right, but uh, the defect generation is, well, it's a consequence of the strain uh, applied uh, during the rolling process. Okay, thank you, Fulvio. Uh, we have uh, just a, maybe a, one, one more question here. Uh, it says, is it possible to focus on refining the subgrain structure as opposed to grain refinement? So maybe a, a fairly general question. Uh, right. Yeah, the subgrain, actually, the subgrain structure is more influenced by uh, recovery. So the recovery will, will, uh, Will guide uh, well the well the uh, well the, the the well we will have a, a strong consequence on the subgrain structure. Of course, you can you can if you refine the subgrain structure, this means that well if you apply more strain, uh, you refine the subgrain structure at, at cold deformations. But you're we're talking about hot deformation. So in this way, usually you have a steady state if you have only recovery, and uh, the process parameters uh, will influence on the recovery, and this will, uh, well, will uh, generate uh, uh, a specific subgrain size. And even if you have pancaking, you still have the, well, the, the subgrains being formed inside the grains. And even uh, well, if even if you have the let's say the the, uh, the, the grains being elongated in the pancaking process. Uh, you have the subgrains inside, and usually they keep at the same uh, at the same size or the same temperature and same strain rate and same uh, applied strain. So they remain at the same size inside. So this is a, actually this is a, 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 high, a, a recrystallization at high temperature uh, subject. I also can come back to this to this point uh, privately uh, later on with some Thank figures. Thank you. And we did just have a, a few questions that came in here right at the end. Uh, I think 
you probably love to talk about these all day. Uh, let me give you one more and ask that you've got just maybe a minute or so to explain something that is, uh, I'm sure it could take all day to explain. Uh, question here said, can you explain the variables in the equation on slide 23? And how does this compare to Von Karman's early analysis in the 1920s? So again, it's not fair to ask you to answer that in uh, two minutes or less, but we'll see how we do. Yeah, yes. Uh, well, the the idea of of having the mean flow stress, that, well, is to is to be able to analyze, well, to compare apples with apples and 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 oranges with oranges. So you cannot, if you look at the at the row gap, you have a whole gradient of temperatures, of strains and strain rates. But uh, if you if you just think about the, the mean flow stress, you have an average of all the gradients. You're averaging just one value, and this is the one value that Sims derived in his formulation back in 1954. So he used the mu parameters uh, to calculate something that is the mean flow stress or the average flow stress in the row gap, and we can obtain the same mean flow stress in a laboratory test, in a stress train curve. So this is the way we do the simulations. We compare mean flow stresses. That's, uh, I think this is, uh, this is why I, wa I wanted to say that's why. Okay, great, Fulvio. So again, uh, we did one at a time here. We wanna be, as always, respectful of everyone's time. Uh, so we don't want to uh, run long here and uh, appreciate everybody's time they have spent with us. Uh, there's been a number of questions here. Uh, what we'd like to do is, is follow up after the, this call. Uh, some of the questions I think are, are great discussion points and our team loves to talk about these things. So uh, we, we will follow up following the call. If you have any technical questions about the operation of your Gleeble, please contact our service team. As I mentioned in a previous webinar, we have a new service portal uh, that's really great. It includes a really useful knowledge base and a convenient service ticketing system. So it's for current customers only, uh, So, but customers can create an account. So again, if you go to our website, Gleeble.com, click on the resources tab in the top navigation bar and then scroll down, you'll see the service portal. Uh, click on there, you can create an account. Uh, it happens pretty quickly uh, within about 24 to 48 hours, our team can get back to you. And then you can search the knowledge base, uh, help yourself with some, some information, as well as create support tickets, which is really the best way to get support, uh, given that our team is usually traveling around the world, so it's better than emailing one of our service guys. If you have any questions about how the Gleeble can support your research, please email me. Uh, I'll connect you to uh, an applications expert. Uh, you've got you know, teams all over the world, happy to help you. Uh, but my email address is dan.quigley at gleeble.com. It should be in the emails that come out about these webinars. Again, please sign up for the upcoming webinars. You can do that right on our website on that webinars page, again, in the resources tab. Again, appreciate everyone's time. Thank you, and uh, please stay safe and healthy.